Our reading today is from Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 25. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Chris. Good morning. I'm Jake, one of the pastors here. Let's pray as we dive in. Holy Spirit, we just welcome your presence here in this place. We thank you for the work you've already been doing. God, we believe that you, you've been working um, earlier this week. You've been working this morning. God, it's not just this place, uh, but it is the spirit that we all carry with us that work. And so, God, we just give you these moments. Um, God, we pray that uh, the things that you've already been doing would just continue to be provoked. God, we pray for, for new insights and and. Uh, challenges and comforts to come out from your word here in these next moments together. Jesus, I pray that, that any words that come from my mouth over these next moments together would be solely from you, and that your spirit would just guide us in this time. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So we are uh, we're continuing our series that we're calling Almost Christian. And this series comes out uh, of a book called Soul Searching by a researcher named Christian Smith um, that came out a number of years ago. And he and his team um, did a whole research project on teenagers asking what was the faith like that they were actually living. So they surveyed teens who, who said they're Christians and yet compared the way that they were living and what they actually believed to what the scriptures portray as far as what it really means to be Christian. And what he found was that, that a number of teenagers within America were actually not living out the full Christian faith. There was another book that then came out from a woman named Kenda Creasy Dean who had helped with the research um, with Christian Smith, and, and her book was called Almost Christian. And what she expanded on the research was that it wasn't just teenagers that were following this less than faith, but it was actually their parents who were the ones that were passing on this faith to the teenagers. And so what the research had talked about was that there were a number of people who claimed to be Christian, and yet when we dug into the actual beliefs that were guiding their lives, it was really this thing that was Christian-ish, that was almost Christian, that was called moralistic, therapeutic deism. And the three tenets were pretty simple. God wants you to be good, be moral, do the best you can, as long as you're not Hitler, you should be okay. Just, just live a good life. Secondly, God and the main goal of life is to make you happy. God wants you to feel good. God wants to bless you. And so that should be our pursuit. And then lastly, God's not really that involved. 
God was the watchmaker in the sky. He got things going. But now you're just supposed to just live your life. Do your best. Again, be good, feel good, and do the best you can. What we're going to look at this morning is kind of the therapeutic aspect of moralistic therapeutic deism and what we're going to call the vending machine God. And if we're being honest, there is an element of our faith, of our lives, where we approach God like a giant vending machine. I found this, this vending machine online. This is a place in Singapore, um, and it's literally an entire room that is a vending machine. And they have everything imaginable. There's cold drinks, there's hot drinks, there's hot meals. Some of these actually operate as microwaves that when you punch in your order, the microwave actually turns on so that by the time you get to the door, your meal is hot and ready. Interestingly, if you look at the signs, you can't read them, but they have a whole sign and section of this place dedicated just to orange juice, which I thought was interesting. I don't, I don't know what it is about orange juice in Singapore, but anything you want, pretty much, you can find within this place. And again, if we're honest, we can approach our relationship with God as if it's this giant vending machine. We go in with our piety, with our good deeds. We've done the right things. We've been reading our Bibles. We, we bring our promises to God. Well, if you do this for me, God, I promise that I'll do that. We even use our theology, right? We'll quote Bible verses that say, well, Jesus, you said, ask whatever we want in your name, and I'll give it, you will give it to us. So, you know, God, we're just doing what you told us to do. And so we, we approach God, we pay, we tell God what we want, we punch in our order, and we expect God to provide. And the question for us this morning is, is the vending machine God actually a satisfying life? Because I think for some of us, that sounds really great, this idea that, that God would serve us, the God who would just give us whatever we want because God is supposed to make us happy. Will that actually make us happy? Anybody fans of the TV show The Good Life? If you've watched, and it just came to an end for some of us that might have, I mean, yes, my wife and I watched it a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, no, it's ending. But it was kind of a beautiful ending at the same time, but they philosophically kind of dug into this question. In their second to last episode, the main characters actually end up in the good place, end up in heaven, and heaven is portrayed as this thing, this place that you'll get whatever you want. Ask for a bottled water, and it just like appears in your hands. There are these magic green doors that you can walk through, and if you just think about whatever you want to experience before you go through these green doors, you'll experience it, and you'll get it. But what the main characters find is that everybody there in heaven is actually bored to death, because even the best thing in the world gets kind of boring after the millionth time that you've experienced it. And so philosophically, they kind of say, you know what, getting whatever we want might not be all that it's it's cooked up to be. And what I want to look at this morning is from a theological standpoint. The vending machine God kind of runs into three main problems that we can find in our text here this morning. So Simon is this kind of main character within this, this passage, and he's kind of an interesting figure. He's got some kind of magical powers, some kind of sorcery powers that from a cultural standpoint would have been understood as some kind of supernatural ability that couldn't have been explained by the science of the time. But more so, what's interesting in, in the meaning of this term is that when the Bible talks about magic and sorcery, there was also a selfish component to it. So we'll actually see a contrast within this passage of a, a power that Simon is using for himself versus the power of God that comes through Philip and the power that's within the Holy Spirit that's actually about healing and signs and wonders and doing good for others. And so Simon has this ability, has these powers so much so that he is proclaiming and boasting to be great. And it's not only that he's boasting that, but all of the Samaritans, they're saying that he's actually rightly called the great power of God. And again, culturally in the Samaritan perspective, what's happening here is Simon's actually claiming to be a deity. He's claiming to be God. And the people are seeing what he has the ability to do, and they're saying, yeah, this guy is, is godly. This God is divine. Look at what he can do. The fact is, is that Simon has gone to the vending machine. And he's getting what he wants 
over and over and over again, and it's going to his head. The first problem that we run into with the vending machine God is actually that we take on the role of God in that relationship. We're the ones in control. We're the boss. God is actually minimized in this because we're the ones calling the shots. We're walking up to the machine. We're punching the buttons. We're declaring what we want. And so God is actually minimized and God's power is stripped away. In a lot of ways, in the vending machine, God relationship, God becomes this cosmic butler who just exists to do our beck and call. Which again, it sounds great, right? This God who serves us, but it's only great until that moment that the butler shows up with an empty tray. It's only great until we punch the buttons and we get a, out of stock, or get stuck on the spindles and we're left staring at the machine going, ah, oh, you're toying with me as you kind of almost gave me what I wanted, but now it's just dangling there. And so what do we do when we are in the position of God and we've declared what we want? What happens when the divine butler doesn't provide? Well, we get angry. Our entitlement actually leads us to this place of bitterness and anger. Now, because our premise, our, our, our theology said that God wants to make me happy and I'm not happy, therefore now, well, God obviously doesn't care about me. And we direct all of this energy and emotion towards God that, that we're angry because God doesn't give us what we want, but yet what does the saying go that when you point one finger at yourself, actually three, when you point one finger at someone else, you're pointing three back at yourself. See, what actually I think happens in our anger in this scenario is God becomes the scapegoat. Because really what happens when we're not getting what we want, now all of a sudden we're feeling inadequate. We're feeling out of control. We're feeling scared. We were God. We were great. But now we're not. And so, again, what do we do with that? And this is something that we see again from Simon. Simon was this great person, and now all of a sudden, this guy Philip comes along with a different kind of power, power from the Holy Spirit, power that is doing signs and wonders and healing people. And the people believe, and they're baptized. Even Simon, it says that Simon believes and was baptized, but then it says that he followed Philip everywhere. I mean, you can just see the ulterior motive here for Simon, right? Simon had a booming church, Lots and lots of people were flocking his way. They were worshiping him. And then all of a sudden, this other guy comes, and everybody's leaving and going to see this Philip guy. And so Simon wants what Philip has. But it's not this authentic wanting God, wanting the Holy Spirit. It's actually still this selfish drive. And you even see this even more so when Peter and John show up, and they begin laying hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit. Simon offers them money and says, I want that same thing. But look at his question. Simon doesn't say, well, I want to experience the Holy Spirit. Simon doesn't say, I want to have this same experience that everybody else is having. Simon says, I want you to give me this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Simon actually wants to be great again. He wants the recognition, he wants the authority, he wants the power so that he is able to bestow so that people are now worshiping him again. And so the first problem of the vending machine God is that we take on the role of God, but the second problem is simply that we become a consumer. When it comes to the vending machine God, it's all about me all about what I want, what I need. And the vending machine, God, just becomes another thing that we're pursuing, that we're chasing, that we're trying to find satisfaction by accumulating stuff. And that philosophy, that idea and way of thinking actually begins to permeate the rest of our life. So we actually begin to approach our other relationships, our jobs, our bank accounts. That consumeristic mindset just follows us 
We come into a church service, and rather coming in to just receive from God, we come in to get from God, and we want things to be our way and said a certain way and done a certain way so that we're feeling comfortable within the vending machine God relationship. We simply become consumers. And the problem with that is that we will never find satisfaction because it's not actually God that is giving us fulfillment. It's only the things that God can give us. And so it will break down. Now, the third problem, we've got to dig just a little bit into the text. So I hope you'll hang with me on this. Is there's this interesting debate within this text because there's this interesting disconnect that happens within the story, because the people believe and are baptized, and then yet it's a later time that Peter and John come and lay hands on them to give them the Holy Spirit. And the text even says that the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of the people. And it's interesting to note that other stories within Scripture seem to communicate a slightly different experience. That some people, it's just you believe and the Spirit comes upon you. And so is this some formula that we need to follow? Or is there something else going on here? And it's really interesting when we dig into the text to think that there might be something else that's going in here. And this is not discrediting. There's a power when we come together as a community and we lay hands on one another. There is for sure a bestowing of the Holy Spirit, and I think this text shows that. But sometimes the Holy Spirit comes in lots of different ways. So it's, again, it's interesting in this text. We have to go back to the Old Testament to understand this a little bit. The kingdom of Israel was divided back in the time of the prophets. The northern kingdom, their capital was Samaria. The southern kingdom, their capital was Jerusalem. And for generations upon generations, there was conflict, there was hatred, there was division between these Samaritans and between the Jews in Jerusalem. They did not like each other. If you think about it in the context of a vending machine God, both of these groups of people probably would have requested one of two things from the vending machine God. First, to stay separate. We don't want to be near each other. We don't like them. We don't like their scum of the earth. Keep us away from them. Or they would have requested to have certain things happen for them that made them better than the other. Situations that they could lord it over them. We're better than you. Ha ha. The hatred was so deep that in Luke, Jesus says that he was going to go to Samaria, so he sends some messengers on ahead, and actually they're rejected. They're turned away at the gates, and the people there did not welcome. Interestingly, John, who shows up in our text to give them the Holy Spirit, he's one of the disciples that says to Jesus in that moment, should I pray down fire from heaven to destroy the Samaritans? And that's how deep the hatred was, that just because they reject Jesus, John's like, we should just burn them. We should destroy them. Now, what's interesting in this story, though, is that Philip is welcome. Why is Philip welcome? Philip was not a Jew from Jerusalem. Philip was most likely a Hellenistic Jew, a Greek Jew. And so he had a different background, a different nationality. And because he's the one that goes to Samaria, he's welcomed, he's accepted, he's able to preach the good news, perform the signs and wonders and the power of the Spirit. And it actually opens the door for now Peter and John to go and visit Samaria because now there's some common ground. Now we believe some of the same things, and so Peter and John are able to go and pray the Holy Spirit on to these new believers. And what's interesting to think about is had the, Jew, uh, the Jews from Jerusalem gotten their way from the vending machine God, they either would have never gone or they would have been the ones to bring it first because they got to be the ones to say, well, you know, your faith comes from us. We came first. But they didn't get their way. They probably would have been turned away at the doors again because of the hatred. On the flip side, had the Holy Spirit come from Philip, from the Hellenistic Jew, that probably would have only divided the two groups of people because then the Samaritans would have said, well, we don't need you. We've got the Holy Spirit already. We're good. 
Or it could have created the Samaritans to say, well, we're, we're better than you. We've got this spirit. And now the Jerusalem Jews, well, they're skeptical. of. I mean, it just could have been even more messy. And yet God was up to something different. And I love what one commentator said. God was working in ways that promoted both the outreach of the gospel and the unity of the church. Neither the Samaritans nor the Jews from Jerusalem would have gotten what they wanted from the vending machine, but God was up to something bigger. And that leads us to what the third problem of the vending machine God is, is that we ask in the role of God as a consumer on a really limited perspective. We're walking up to that machine and we've got blinders on. We know what we want. We think we know what's best. And the question is, is, well, what if God is doing something a little bit different? I experienced this two weeks ago. My family um, took a vacation down to Orlando. These are my kids, Sean and Nora. Um, we went to Disney World. We did that vacation that every family is supposed to do because, you know, it's the most magical place on earth. The only problem is, is my kids didn't get that memo. And we went down on vacation, and we had all of these expectations, and in a sense, went to the vending machine God and had been praying for health and for safe travels and for really fun times together as a family and for these great experiences. And right from the get-go, things didn't quite go the way that we were hoping. Getting on to the airplane, my son started to act a little lethargic and was not feeling very well. And so right to start off, we had to change some of our plans because he was starting to get sick. And that made us lose some of our fast pass reservations. Our well laid out plans and strategies right from the get go fell by the wayside. And so Monday, we, he was feeling well enough that we went out to Animal Kingdom. And the very first ride, we went to this thing called Bugs Life, which is like a 4D show. And within like minutes of this show starting, my daughter starts writhing and screaming in fear. I mean, I've not seen my daughter scared like this that much. And so I have to grab her and run out of the ride um, and take her outside where she's just like bawling her eyes out and going, I didn't like that. My son stayed in the whole time, but my wife said when she got out that he, he was saying, well, I don't like this, I don't like this as well through part of it. So it was like, all right, first ride was a fail. We just waited all that time, like, all right. So we went on a Triceratops ride. That was fun. That was like a really good moment. Um, and that was right next to another ride called Dinosaur that we're like, okay, we'll do that one. This is going to be fun. We waited in line for an hour. My kids complained the entire time. Like, when are we coming? I mean, there was like twice, you know, the whole like, we're going to turn the car around. Like, it was like, we're going to get out of line. We're going to go home. Just stop. And so they're whining the whole time. But we finally got up to the front. And we sit down. And immediately, my daughter's getting squirrely and nervous. This is going to be scary. And we're like, nope, it's not super fast. You should be fine. It's all pretend. And she's like, no, I don't know. Well, they buckle us in. And this ride starts. And again, I mean, my daughter just loses it, starts screaming. And now there's nothing I can do because this thing is moving. So like, I can't get off of this ride. Um, and then shortly after that, I start hearing my son scream, I don't like this. I want to get off. I don't like this. And so like, we get done with the ride. And I mean, I seriously think we must have looked like insane, like we had tried to tear our kids' limbs off during this ride. Because it was funny, before getting on, we're pointing at the smiling children coming off at the other line. And, and like, we're coming off, and our kids are losing it. My son unbuckles himself and gets up and goes, we are never coming back here again, and like, stomps away. And we're like, all right. And I tell I texted Scott Tilton at that point and told him this story and was like, I think we're winning Disney. I, I think this is good. So, I mean, we made it the rest of the afternoon and, and had a good experience. The kids crashed at like three. Um, Tuesday, we took the day to rest. We went to Magic Kingdom on Wednesday, which is where this picture was from. And, and still, for most part, had a good day, but they complained the whole day about waiting and lines and everything. Um, wanted to make it, like we'd started off the day making it, wanting to make it for the fireworks. That quickly went away that we're like, we'll just make it to the parade. And I mean, literally 2.45, the parade in Disney starts at 3. Kids are toast. We're like, we'll get them ice cream. The line for ice cream was a 45-minute wait. I mean, it was just like, okay, forget it. Uh, we had had plans to go to Universal Studios as well that we just completely ditched because we're like, this is not working. And so the week went nothing the way that we had wanted it to go. The vending machine ask did not give us what we asked for. But it was really interesting at the end of the week as my wife and I were talking through our experiences that one, even that dinosaur ride, 
sitting down at dinner on that Monday night as our family was reenacting those moments, as my son is reenacting his angry um, rant at getting off the ride, we are dying laughing. And we just know that this is going to be a family memory now we get to share for years going back to that. But then the second piece of it is that everything going wrong and dealing with the failure of the week and being a good team about it and actually responding to all of these different things actually was something really, really healing based on some older family wounds and previous situations that had happened in the past. It was like God knew that what we needed wasn't actually just this successful, perfect week, but it was actually he, we needed everything to go wrong because that was going to be more healing and more important for our family. See, the vending machine God breaks down because our perspective is limited because sometimes God has a bigger perspective in mind of what's actually happening. So how do we avoid the vending machine God view in our lives? Well, I think there are three invitations that God has for us this morning. And I, as I go through these, I really believe that, that, that one of these is for you this morning based on whatever place you're in. And so as I go through these, just be asking the Holy Spirit, which, which one of these is, is for me? And the first invitation is actually to lean into practicing gratitude. Maybe you are in a place right now where, where you've been asking of God certain things, and God's been saying yes. God's been giving you those things. And I think the thing for you this morning is that that's not something to be ashamed of. That's not something to feel guilty about. But the important thing is actually to have the perspective of where all of our good and perfect gifts come from and to actually be thanking God that things are good right now and to be careful of a place of calling yourself great or your own life great, but instead having gratitude of the one who actually gives us those gifts. And so is that you this morning? Are things pretty good? What would it look like for you this morning as we move into communion in a few minutes for us as we worship together to bring this thankful heart full of gratitude to God, of acknowledging you are God and these good gifts in my life have come from you. God, thank you. Having an attitude like Job that God gives but God can take away. Having an attitude like Paul where he's learned to be content in all situations because of this perspective of placing God in the place that God is supposed to be. So is that you today? I would invite you later in a moment here to practice gratitude. For some of us, though, there's an invitation that we need to repent. And this is what we see in this text as well from Simon, that Simon, as he tries to buy the Holy Spirit, Peter rebukes him pretty harshly, and he says to repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart, that you can buy the Holy Spirit, that you just want to have something so that you can be great again. What Peter is calling him on is that his motives are really misplaced. You're being a consumer. And this idea to repent, the word in Greek is metaneo, and it means to change one's mind or purpose. Literally, it means to turn around. And so for some of us here this morning, there's an invitation to actually acknowledge that we're living life as a consumer. We're approaching God as this vending machine, and it's all about me. And God wants to bring about a change in you this morning. Maybe God doesn't want to give you what you've been asking because God wants to give you a new heart this morning so that you start to ask for things in a different perspective with a different motivation that's kingdom-minded and that's godly-minded. And so for you, what would that look like as we move to the table in a few moments, as we move into worship? Just come to God with a repentant heart, an open heart willing to be changed, willing to get rid of the thing you're asking for because you're acknowledging that it's really about you. And the last invitation is actually one of trust. Think about Peter and John in this situation. They had been rejected from going to Samaria before. They would have liked to be the ones to go to Samaria to begin with, and now they're coming because somehow the good news is already there. 
They didn't know what to expect. They didn't know what kind of hostility may have faced them. They had to enter into the situation with a full trust of, well, what is God doing? And we're going to trust that process. My dad often likes to remind me of a season in my life that I used to sign off my emails with the uh, tagline, God is in control. The thing is, is sometimes that life is painful. Sometimes life is just confusing. But God invites us into this deeper relationship where we can actually trust that God is doing something bigger than what we maybe can see because of our blinders. One of the biggest pitfalls of the vending machine God is that the vending machine God is impersonal. It's inanimate. But God invites us into an actual relationship to know that we are loved, to know that we are sons and daughters, and to know that we have a heavenly parent that will actually parent us in a way that leads to maturity, that doesn't just lead us to happiness, but to actually an abundant and a full life. And so maybe there's something that you're asking for right now that you're not getting, and it's simply because God has something better. And you can't see that, and it's hard to see, but I think the invitation for you this morning is that God is asking you, are you going to trust? Are you going to trust that God's got the long game? God has the bigger picture. God knows what God is doing. And there's an invitation to trust him today. So again, as we move to the communion table, I just want to pray over us that you would meet with the Holy Spirit. Let's stand together. If you'd like to hold out your hands in a posture of receiving, you can do that. Holy Spirit, we we thank you for the invitations here this morning, God, to enter into you. I pray right now for every single one of us that you would just make it abundantly clear, God, the work that you want to do in our hearts and our minds here in this place. Lead us into a place of authentic gratitude, God, that we uh, would just be moved to a place of celebration and thanksgiving. God, move us into a place of wholehearted repentance. God, that we can come to you with our mixed motivations, with our consumeristic attitudes, God, and we can give those things to you. And and God, we will not be met with shame, but instead we will be met with love and forgiveness and grace. And so, God, for those of us who need a new heart this morning, may you invite us into that here with you. God, may you deepen our trust and our faith. God, those who are in the midst of difficult situations or in the midst of of confusing times, God, we just ask that you would draw near to those of us who need that right now. God, you would help us to understand what a deeper trust in you really looks like so that, that we can experience peace in the uncertainty, in the not knowing, in the not yet. God, just meet with each of us here as we come to the table together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.